All right, it's the top of the hour, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Welcome to my course, Workplace Culture Makeover Masterclass. So my promise to you today is that I am going to teach you all kinds of things about culture change. I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to do if your change is to be successful. So get out your pad and paper, close your door, use this time as time to learn, remove all of the distractions, turn your cell phone off, really use this time to learn. I also encourage you to remove all of your I knows and your I can'ts and your I'm not sure's. Just take it all in, use this as an opportunity to learn. This webinar is based on all of my years experience working with organizations to create better work environments. And I know without a doubt that you have to do these things to be successful in culture change. There are a whole lot of areas to focus on when doing culture change. And so what I've done for this webinar is just sort of picked some of the main areas where I see organizations sort of fail in their culture change. And I want to bring them to your attention. Uh, some of the areas are just areas that absolutely need focus. You're in the right place today if you want to change your organizational culture but don't know how. If you know that a positive work environment will save your business time and money in the long run. If you want to be a hero to your workforce by giving them a better work environment. Or maybe you know that creating a positive work environment is an employer's moral and ethical responsibility. Or maybe you're sick and tired of dealing with all the drama that comes with a negative work environment. Or maybe you're here because you want to elevate your skills in HR or leadership by learning how to tackle culture change. So today we're going to cover quite a few different things. We'll discuss surveys, we'll discuss creating strategic plans, we'll discuss using your vision and core values to drive culture change, and then we'll finish off with some tips for onboarding. And if you stick around until the end for the full 60 minutes, I will send you a list of 30 ways to bring your core values to life. But you have to hang on until the end to get the list. So I want to start by just introducing myself in case you, you've never met me or haven't attended one of my webinars before. If you've attended one of my webinars before, you've heard my story. So I uh, was a director of human resources for a nonprofit organization here in San Diego where I live. And I found myself working with a workplace bully. This person was an uber excessive micromanager. He definitely made it clear if he didn't like you. He didn't trust people. He yelled a lot. He just made life hard for everyone, including me. And I personally felt bullied by this person. But then as the director of HR, I dealt with all of the organizational problems that he created. I spent a lot of time rehiring you know, people in. He, I would hire people in, they would leave, and then I'd have to hire new people in. I spent a lot of time counseling people in my office. I spent a lot of time getting counseling myself from another manager down the hall. And I spent a lot of time in the president's office talking to him about about this person's behavior and essentially begging the president to step in and put a stop to it. And the president would always just say, well, that's just how he is, or don't let it bother you, or be the bigger person. And it was, it was hard to deal with. During all of that time, I started getting my master's degree at San Diego State, and I had a class called the Dark Side of Communication, if you can believe it. And in this class, we learned about all things dark in human interaction. We learned about stalking and domestic violence and sibling rivalry. And of course, I had to write a paper on something dark, and so I decided to write a paper on my situation at work. I decided to write a paper on this person that I worked with. He was dark for me. And it was during that paper that I came across the phrase workplace bullying. And I have been obsessed with that topic ever since. I have read everything I could get my hands on in bullying. I've uh, worked with many clients to solve the problem of workplace bullying. I've uh, you know, spoken all around the world on that topic. Well, when I first started my business helping organizations end bullying, I realized that I needed to make a paradigm shift and I had to go from ending bullying to creating a positive work environment. And so over time, I began to realize that the anecdote, if you will, for workplace bullying is a positive work environment. And so I've become just as passionate about the opposite of workplace bullying as I am about workplace bullying. And so, uh, you know, everything I do in my business is around helping organizations build positive work environments. 
And since I've been in business, I've been cited in a huge list of some pretty cool media venues. I've been in Forbes, USA Today, Psychology Today, and even on time.com. And I've served a huge range of clients from Fortune 500s down to little tiny nonprofits, little community businesses. I've served universities, hospitals, big business, uh, and everything in between. So I want to start off by telling you about two paradoxes that I've noticed out there in the world. And these paradoxes really drive kind of my, my point of view on solving workplace bullying and ultimately creating a positive work environment and culture change. So one thing I see a lot is that everybody seems to agree that bad behaviors are organizational problems, that the culture of the organization is the reason those things happened. But most advice out there on the internet and, and even in academics is all focused around solutions for the individual. So there is not a ton of advice out there about taking a culture from bad to good. There's a lot of advice out there about culture change, but there's not a lot of advice that's really focused around taking a bad culture to a good culture. The other paradox I've noticed is that while culture seems to be very intangible and unreachable, if, if you don't know how to change it, um, it does feel out of reach, but tangible and reachable steps are needed to achieve the culture that you want. Um, but again, most advice out there is very theoretical. So most books on culture, and I've read quite a few of them, are, are often around the model that the author uses. Um, change the culture, change the game, for example. It's about this model that they use, the triangle. But there isn't actually a whole lot of information in those books about what exactly you're supposed to do to change culture. And so I've become very interested in, in the opposite of that and gathering all of the small steps needed to have a big impact on culture. And that's what this webinar is about. I'm gonna give you some very actionable, tangible steps to focus on culture change. So let's start at the beginning, a very good place to start. Let's talk about some steps you can take as you jump into creating a new culture for your work environment. So, of course, a good place to start is with your survey before you do culture change so that you can benchmark where you are now and also so you can understand what you need to focus on. And now HR people call me all the time and they want to do a survey and they're ready to jump in. And it's clear, though, that they haven't thought the whole thing through. So I always suggest taking a step back and before you do a survey, really needing to understand the answers to 14 different questions um, so that you can be positive you're ready to act on the survey results. Nothing's worse than doing a survey and then not doing anything with the results. You will drive distrust up. So I'm not going to share all 14 questions here in this webinar, but I'm going to point out some of the most important questions that I think you need to have answers to before you do a survey. So first up, it's good to take a step back and ask, what's the point of the survey? What are you trying to get out? Get at? Now, I, I think that probably sounds a little bit uh, like, okay, duh, but I just want to share some examples with you. So for one, for one example, I was hired by an HR professional who is the HR person in the corporate office, and this company has work sites all over the place. And they do an employee engagement survey corporate-wide, and then, of course, compare the different work site results with each other. And this HR professional up there in the corporate office, she noticed that this one work site had particularly low scores compared to the rest of the work sites. So she asked me to come on board and work with this work site to change engagement and, and bring their engagement scores up. So when I go to visit to the, the work site and I sit down with the administrator at the work site and I, I just asked her, first off, tell me what you think the issues are here. She immediately went, communication. And I remember she was kind of leaning forward in her, in her chair and she's like, communication. And our whole conversation was around how she recognized that internal communication wasn't working very well. Departments were talking to each other. People weren't talking to each other. Um, they had a hard time figuring out what's the right information or what's the right amount of information to, to send out to the workforce. So all of our conversation was around communication. Now, this is, this is a good story because it reminds us that just because an engagement score is low or just because somebody in the corporate tower thinks that something's wrong, uh, it's important to take a step back and really 
take a look at what are really and truly the problems. So if I had, uh, what I ended up doing actually was redoing the survey because they do this engagement survey corporate wide. I redid a survey that was focused more around the problems that this administrator had brought up. Um, but think about if I had done the survey around engagement, I wouldn't have had very useful information. I needed to do the survey more around what's wrong with the communication. Um, so again, just make sure you take a step back and kind of ask yourself, what is it that we really and truly need to know? Another question that you need to have an answer to before you do a survey is what is your communication plan? What's your plan before, during, and after the survey? So let me show you this. So first up, let's take a look at your pre-survey communication. Communication has to come from the top leader and it has to describe the rationale for the survey and, and essentially ask people to participate in the survey and let people know that, that your responses are important, we can't make change unless we hear from you, and please know that the results of the survey will be shared with the workforce. So there has to be some sort of pre-survey marketing that goes on so that uh, people are prepared to say, take the survey and so that they feel hyped up about it. I think a lot of organizations, they may send one email out that just kind of says, hey, we have a survey coming up, and then they send out the link to the survey. But you have to see yourself as a marketer. The idea is to get buy-in from your employees so that they'll participate. So the, the more people who participate, the more valid your results are, the more able you are to make culture change in a way that, that they need. Uh, so next up, during the survey, um, I recommend communication coming from two different places. You as HR will send information out about the survey. You'll be the one who's sort of the keeper of the survey and sending out the link for people to, to take the survey. But you also, during the time that the survey is open, you absolutely want the leaders, the, the CEO for example, to be sending emails out as well. And again, just reminding people of the importance of participation. Um, and ensuring that uh, people feel comfortable to take the survey, always talking about the fact that their responses will be confidential uh, and that the more participation, the better able the organization is to solve the problems that people come up with. Now, this is very important. This is another place that I see as sort of a fail. Um, Right after the survey closes, within seven days, you absolutely have to send an email out that says, thank you for participating. Uh, we had X number of people respond or the percentage, you know, the percentage of the response rate. And also asking people to participate in culture change. So now your email is essentially saying, we've got the results, they're in. We already see some problems that we know we want to solve. We need your help. We want you to be on board. So you've got to get start rallying the troops, rallying the masses. Uh, and then let everyone know in that seven-day email that the results are being analyzed and a summary will go out. So again, um, actually people are more inclined to take a survey if they know they'll get to see the results. So that has to be a big part of your messaging. Now that you've promised that in the pre survey communication. Uh, now that the survey is closed, you do have to say, hey, that, that information is coming your way. We're going to keep our promise. And then lastly, uh, within 14 days of the survey closing, then uh, I absolutely believe that you need to send out your uh, results. Now you're not going to send out the whole report with all the dirty details to the entire workforce, but you will send out an email that offers up some themes. Uh, that kind of says, here's the overarching themes that we saw. And again, rallying the troops, letting people know that you're gonna need them on board to uh, help you make change. And then one thing that's very important about this email is that you offer up at least three immediate action items that you're gonna do right, right now. So you'll say, here are the themes in the survey, right now, today, in order to start moving forward and resolving these problems, here are three things we're gonna do. So these are just sort of good faith effort kind of a kind of action so that people go, okay, we were heard, we, let's see what happens next. Next, you need to be sure you're thinking about confidentiality. 
Now this can be an easy one if you're doing the survey online. SurveyMonkey, for example, just gives you a little radio button you can select to ensure that confidentiality is there. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind is comments. So if you have an open-ended survey question where you're asking for comments, those comments may help you understand who said what. People might you know, offer up sort of identifying information in those comments. Uh, so you have to promise yourself that you're going to keep that information to yourself as the keeper of the survey. You're not going to go around saying, oh, I know that Brian said this and John said that. Um, you've got to remove all of that stuff from the comments when you're preparing the survey report so that people really do feel comfortable that things were confidential. This is another big survey fail that I see where HR maybe does a survey because it was free or it was low cost. Uh, and so they get all excited about doing the survey and they get permission to do the survey, but they forget to get permission to uh, react to the survey results. And so before you do a survey, you have to be darn sure that your C-suite is going to spend money on solving the problems that come up in the survey, and you need to be darn sure that your leaders are not going to be offended. So uh, just a quick story, we actually did a survey for a company and the uh, CEO was very offended by the results and really just kind of said, I don't think that's how it is around here. I, I just don't think this is reality. And he just sort of shut down. I don't know what happened from there, but uh, that kind of a reaction makes things worse. And in fact, people in the comments even said, I'm afraid to respond. Uh, I don't, I'm sort of scared of the culture here. I'm afraid, but I'm going to put myself out there since you're asking. And I'm just praying that something happens as a result of my comments. Uh, and so for the leader to react that way was pretty disappointing on my end. And I can only imagine how much worse off the culture is there now that the, the leader had reacted that way. The last question you want to have the answer to is thinking about who's going to be your survey champion. So, of course, you're a survey champion and your leader's got to be a survey champion, but you also want to make sure your managers are champions. So before the survey goes out, you want to ask your managers to participate in encouraging people to take the survey. And you may even have employees who could be champions. So for example, one client we worked with, um, we were getting a, having a hard time getting people to respond. And one employee told a story about how she basically went around her department and was like, did you take the survey? Did you take the survey? Did you take the survey? Uh, and when people would say, no, I don't know. I don't really know what's going to happen with the results. I don't know if I want to. She was really kind of like, hey, this is our chance to say what's on our mind. Why wouldn't you do it? Why wouldn't you take advantage? And she had said that she was able to convince several people to take the survey. So you, you kind of want to identify who else is going to help me get participation in the survey. So some last important tips about your climate survey or your, your culture survey, all communication around the survey must appear urgent. The communication that comes right after the survey is closed needs to essentially say, oh my gosh, we see these problems, we have to fix them, the sky is falling. That's how the, the communication needs to be. All of your follow through has to be urgent or you'll lose trust. Uh, you definitely want to celebrate and advertise any small wins. So if you do that low-hanging fruit, once you're finished with them, celebrate them, market it, send an email out, hey, we did those things. Also, be open to talking about the survey results. So be aware that people may have additional comments or if once they see the themes, they may have things to say. So you really do have to have that open door policy. And finally, be objective. Um, don't try to plead the organization's case or don't get defensive. You don't persuade employees to change their opinions. Uh, you just got to take that survey data in. So I'm just curious, how are we doing so far? Are these tips sounding useful for you? How, how are we feeling? I see some yeses. I'll see. I, I see some yeses. Perfect. I'm seeing this information is great and useful. I see one question, uh, question about sending the slides. I'm actually not going to send you the slides, but I will send you the recording. So you, you will absolutely have uh, the opportunity to go back in and 
pause the recording wherever you need to so you can take a look at things. All right, perfect. Glad to see you guys are doing well. Let's go ahead and move forward. So next up, let's talk about your strategic plan. So this is the template that I use with clients and uh, want to point you to the seven day uh, top part at the top there. Now I'm not going to actually talk about doing a survey in this webinar because that's a whole webinar all on its own. Um, so we'll, we'll just stick to uh, talking, moving about the, the strategic plan. Okay, so uh, first off, as I mentioned, you absolutely need some immediate responses to the data in order to build trust and show there's good faith effort in making change. So the top of the strategic plan that I share with clients has this, this piece immediately, uh, things are gonna implement immediately. Uh, and again, really, this is just a good faith effort. It's you saying, hey, I heard you, uh, we heard you, and we're going to react right now. So it's a great way to build trust. So let me give you some examples of some low-hanging fruit. Um, one example might be that the leader reacts to the results in some positive way. So for example, uh, one client I worked with, people really said they felt they didn't have access to the administrator uh, of this work site. And so, um, she cleared her schedule and she basically sent an email out that said for the next four days my schedule is clear i've cleared it off make an appointment with me and i'll meet with you and she said quite a few people came through she had a lot of really great conversations with people and she's actually really changed the way that she manages she now goes to staff meetings more often uh she's just you know it was a real good clear sort of good positive slap in the face for her that she needed to make herself more present and available and, and appear around the office a lot more. So that was a great way to just say, I saw the survey results and right away I'm reacting. I'm going to clear my schedule. Come talk to me. I don't like that you guys felt like you don't have access to me and I want to fix that. Another example of low hanging fruit might be to implement some new process. So if there's a kind of an easy, you know, low hanging fruit kind of a process that you can change quickly, then do that. And obviously if there's things that are more complicated, they'll go in your strategic plan. But if there's something simple that will make people happy, then implement that right away. You might also provide some sort of inexpensive item. So if people, uh, you know, said in the survey that they want more opportunity to have lunch with, with each other, or they want to do see more staff events or something, then just cancel Friday and let's have a staff event, you know, order some pizza and make it happen. Uh, and another example, I had a client where people said they wanted to have two printer cartridges instead of one. So really easy fix. We can just order another round of printer cartridges. Now everybody gets two. It's not all that expensive in the long run. So look, you know, again, look for these little low hanging fruit options. Or you might hold a meeting. So if you look at your survey data and you see that maybe there isn't really a lot of low hanging fruit there, something that you can implement right away, one low hanging fruit might just be to have a meeting. So you know, send an email out that says, we have the survey results, here are the themes, uh, I'd love to have, you know, either a party, let's meet on Friday at three o'clock and we'll have pizza and we can just kind of hang out. Or maybe you, you have a more formal meeting that's sort of around the survey data. Uh, but again, at that meeting, make sure you're not being defensive and saying, I don't know why you said this or that. Uh, that's not, for, you know, that's not helpful. Um, but so these are examples of some things you can put in your sort of seven day action plan there. So from there, you're literally gonna take your survey data and transfer it over into a strategic plan. So for example, here, this organization, 70% of respondents were either very dissatisfied or dissatisfied with the information about organizational issues. And so, uh, we worked together, it was myself, the leader, and an action committee that we put together, and we you know, basically transfer the data over to the strategic plan. So one of the goals then becomes you know, literally focusing on this problem and trying to solve it. So let's take a look at this kind of in a more general way. So, so this is the strategic plan template that we use. Uh, we have our objectives there. So objectives are the overarching themes that people, you know, that came out of the data. And then there's goals inside those objectives. So for example, in this theme of internal communication, one goal is to improve communication about the company itself. 
Another goal was to create more opportunity for staff to provide their opinions. Uh, something else that came up in the survey was a lot of things pointed to burnout, and so there was a whole lot of goals around burnout. So this is essentially what you do. You take your survey data, you transfer it into your strategic plan, and then you work to execute on the strategic plan. Okay, so let's move on and talk about what needs to be on your strategic plan, uh, or one other thing that needs to be on your strategic plan, which is your vision statement. So I'm gonna, I have a question for you. How many people know their vision statement? And while you guys are commenting, I see some questions, so let me Go back over those and read them. Let me make my little question window a little bigger here so I can read it. Okay, so let's see. Somebody asked me, uh, how do you measure success of, of your strategic plan and more qualitative actions? That question's from Julie. So Julie, uh, I do have an answer for that. It's not covered in this webinar, but ultimately you're right. You do want to uh, measure success of your action items on your strategic plan as they relate to business results. So there's a few different ways to measure success. One is by just essentially saying completed, and sometimes that's that's the answer. It's completed, and that's how you measure it. Uh, sometimes it's that behavior has changed, and sometimes it's ultimately uh, that there's a business result. So for example, if you can say, here's a goal, and, and we're going to reduce turnover by 10% by implementing that goal, that's a business result. That's much better than saying this action item was completed. So that's my short answer, Julie. I, I'm not actually covering that in this webinar today. Um, so hopefully that helps that little bit. Uh, another question, is there a certain software program used? Uh, so I use SurveyMonkey for my surveys, and then the strategic plan is actually just in, in Excel. Okay, let's see. Let's find out. Did you guys say that you knew your vision statement? Okay, so one person says we have a mission, uh, that the vision is more focused on our customers and not our employees. Somebody asked, is a vision the same as a mission statement? Um, Lisa, the vision statement is the statement about where your organization is going. The mission statement is about how you'll get there. And then core values are how you'll behave. So your vision statement is generally an overarching uh, statement that's very general. So I only got a few responses. I'd love the rest of you to answer. Does anybody else know your vision statement by heart? Just type in yes or no. Do you know your vision statement by heart? I got a couple yeses. I got a couple by hearts with exclamations. I got a few no's. All right, okay. Well, those of you that said no, I absolutely encourage you to learn your vision statement. It's going to be very important to culture change. So vision statement is all about where you're going. It's your pin in your map, again. It's your guiding light. It's, it's where you're trying to get to. And then your mission statement is the car. The mission statement is how we'll get there or the plane. Um, so you should know your company vision statement because it should be guiding everything you do and you'll need a vision statement for your culture change. So let's talk about this. Uh, let me, I gotta move this little window. Okay, so, so here are two vision statements here. And vision statement A is very specific, right? So I just made these vision statements up. They don't belong to any specific organization. But vision statement A says to erase hunger and homelessness in San Diego County. And vision statement B says to enrich the quality of life for every employee in every organization you touch. So vision statement A is too focused on um, what the organization is doing. It's too task focused and it's not broad enough to encompass employees. And so that's one of the mistakes I see a lot in vision statements when I'm working with customers on culture change is their vision statement doesn't encompass employees, but your employees are more important than your customers because you can't do anything for your customers without your employees. So I think it's backwards. Vision statement B is much better because it's focused every which way. It's focused on the community, it's focused on employees, um, it's focused on everything. So 
um, this is Vision B is Civility Partners' vision statement, by the way. Um, so the goal is to enrich the quality of life for every employee and every organization we touch. And we can do that in so many different ways, um, but I can also turn it internally. So I have two assistants and I am failing if I'm not focused on enriching their own lives and my own life too. So I want you to be thinking about that. So let's look at this um, kind of a little bit differently. Or let, let me give you some tips about your vision statement. So vision statement B uh, is to enrich the quality of life for every employee in every organization we touch. Again, that's more general. If, vi if your vision statement reads more like vision A, to erase hunger and homelessness in San Diego County, which is very specific, um, for your culture change, you're going to need a separate vision. So let me try to say this again. Vision statement B, the more general, open version that allows you to point your pointers in any which way is more effective. That's what your vision statement should read. Um, if your vision statement for your company does not read this way, and it reads more like vision statement A, where it's very specific, then for culture change, you're going to need to create a separate vision statement that's focused on the culture, and I call that a social vision. The other option is to scratch your vision statement altogether and create a whole new vision that can be pointed every which way that is a little more general. Does this make sense? Sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm not sure if I'm explaining this very well. Does this make sense? Everybody on board with this? I got a couple of yeses. Okay, perfect. So, so the, you know, the bottom line is you have to have a vision if you're going to lead people through change and you get to decide what that is. And, and the reason I, you know, vision B is, is better and I hope you can do that, but not, uh, not everybody has the ability to change the vision. Sometimes uh, people are kind of stuck with a board of directors maybe who created the vision and they're not about to let it go as bad as it might be. Uh, so you may have to create that second social vision for your culture change. Uh, so, so bottom line, you need a vision statement that allows you to make culture change. So just to give you an example of a company that does this really well, oddly enough, Taco Bell uh, does this very well. So Taco Bell's marketing right now is Live Moss. If you've seen any of their commercials, it's all around Live Moss. Um, that's not just their marketing tagline. It's also their tagline for internal activities as well. So Taco Bell really lives Moss inside Taco Bell. Um, so what they do is they bring in, you know, you got an 18 year old kid who gets a job at Taco Bell making minimum wage, um, may not know what they want to do with themselves. They're just there working at Taco Bell making minimum wage. And Taco Bell takes them under their wing and turns their employees into business owners. And so some, don't quote me on this, but something like 70 to 80% of franchise owners of Taco Bells are former employees. So that is living moss. You take an 18 year old kid who doesn't know what to do with himself, who's making minimum wage, and you turn him into a business owner, Taco Bell wins, this kid wins because now he gets to be a business owner. The community wins because now the, there, here's another business that can give jobs. Um, and so Taco Bell really lives Moss in everything they do. It's their marketing tagline externally, but it's also their internal mantra. And so that's, that is a fantastic example of how powerful a vision can be. So let's move on and talk about core competencies. So here's another question. How many of you know your core values? How many of you know your core values by heart? I got one I do. Let's hear from the rest of you. I got a yes. Ooh, someone says they're posted at my desk. I love that. Okay, one person says not me. I know we have them, but we don't have them memorized. Someone's listed out their core values. I'm seeing mostly yeses, a couple no's. Okay, so let's talk about core values. So just like your vision statement, which is gonna drive your culture change, your core values are going to drive your culture change as well. So this is another sort of fail I see from clients is that, um, 
Uh, sorry, Stephen, I see a question. Can you repeat the high level differences between vision and core values? So a vision statement is where you're going. A mission statement is how you'll get there. And the core values are how you'll behave. Uh, someone says, I know my personal core values, but I don't think the organization has any core values. Okay. All right. So, so again, you're going to need your core values in order to change your culture. So this is another fail that I see with clients where they have core values. They've been created somewhere along the line and maybe they're on a poster on the wall and that's about it. Nobody knows them and they're not actually being used to dictate behavior. So it's really interesting because everybody knows they're supposed to have a vision, a mission, and core values, and a lot of organizations have those things, but then they don't do anything with them. It's like they read in an article they're supposed to have it, and so they made it, and then that's all they did with it. But you can really use your core values to drive your culture because core values are all about how people are supposed to behave. Uh, and so culture and behavior are obviously very intertwined, so why not use those? Uh, why, why not, you know, mix them together, use them together. So let's talk about how to use your core values. So you want to turn your core values into core competencies. A core competency is basically a defined level of expertise or competence that someone would have to have in order to be successful in a certain job. So for example, one of my assistants, she has to be able to research stuff. I ask her to research stuff all the time. It has to be a core competency. If she's not good at finding information, she can't do her job. Uh, she, she would not succeed. My other assistant is in my mark. She does marketing. She has to be creative. That has to be her core competency. If she can't be creative, she can't do well in her job, right? Um, and so each of your jobs in your organization um, have these different core competencies related to their job, but they also should have the core competencies related to your culture. So essentially you'd be saying, if you don't live these core values, th these aren't some of your competencies, then you can't work here. You don't fit into our culture. So a competency is usually written out like this. You have your competency and then you have a description of what the behavior looks like. So let me give you an example. Um, if initiative is a core competency that someone has to have, this is how it would be written, initiative, and then you define what that looks like in your organization. Let me give you another example. <clears throat> I worked with an organization that had a chain of chili hot dog restaurants. And this uh, restaurant started off in the 40s. Great grandpa had started this chili hot dog stand. And from there, it's boomed into a chain of restaurants in Southern California. And uh, when we were talking about their core values and they shared that they didn't actually have any core values, um, you know, we, we kind of were talking about the history of the organization and all this stuff. And it came out that great grandpa, who had started this restaurant, he would actually fire people if they skimped on the chili. So if somebody ordered a chili hot dog and he caught an employee not just dumping that chili on that hot dog, he would get mad and he'd fire them. And so we kind of came up with this phrase, don't skimp on the chili, and that's a core value. But then we played on that history of that story of great grandpa, don't skimp on service, don't skimp on quality, don't skimp on fun. And now these are core values, and they're really fun core values. They're related to the history of the organization. So they're very emotional and profound in that they are really tying somebody into the organization, sort of like one degree of separation from great grandpa who started the organization. Now, if we're going to turn those core values into core competencies, again, a competency is the, the, the behavior and then a description of what it looks like. So for example, if we're going to say don't skimp on customer service, that means that customer service is a core competency. Everybody has to have it if they're going to work at this chili hot dog stand. Um, and so maybe this is what that looks like at this particular restaurant, that they can provide excellent service in stressful situations, that they can solve problems, and that they always have a positive image. Uh, another example is quality work. So if we're going to say don't skimp on quality work and that's a core value, then it has to be a core competency as well. So always go the extra mile, self-starter of tasks, you know, work doesn't have to be redone. There's a lot of effort there. And of course, fun can actually also be a core 
competency. You can hold people accountable to fun. Uh, if you've ever flown on a Southwest flight, you know that Southwest holds their employees to being fun as well. Uh, and so maybe this core value, when we turn it into a competency, sort of reads this way. So essentially what you're saying now is these are our core values. Everybody who works here has to be competent in those core values. And if they're not, then they don't need to work here. Does this make sense? You guys, uh, you guys with me on this? I see one of my clients on here. I won't name names, but we did this uh, for her. Hello, <laughs> client oh my. All right, let's see. Um, let's see, I see a question here. I'm sorry. Let me scroll. Where did it go? I thought I saw a question. Sorry guys, um, what if the competencies are different for management and non-management? Would it be better to blend the two or keep them separate? Uh, that's a great question, Arnie, and the answer is that every single person has to be held to the same core values. So competencies are going to be different for every employee. Like the example I gave, one of my employees has to be good at research, one of them has to be good at creative. Those are competencies specific to their jobs, but they also have to be competent in our core values, and so do I. Um, and so any, anybody else that we hire in here, we would always have to ask them, can you live these core values or these in line with your own personal values? Does that answer your question? Someone said, I love chili. <laughs> uh, let's see. Someone else says, uh, I work in education and our statements and core values relate to students and not to staff. So uh, Gabby, that's a mistake that I see. Um, you know, I, I think that your core values and your vision statement has to be focused around everything. They have to point to every, every which way. They have to point externally and internally. Now your mission statement is going to be more focused externally because your mission is about exactly what you do. Um, so, if, so if my vision statement at Civility Partners is to touch the lives of everybody that we interact with, um, my mission statement is that we do that through HR consulting services and helping build positive work environments. So that's a little more focused on the service we offer. But I do think that your vision and your core values have to be focused sort of every which way. Um, and, and that's just, I'm saying that based on experience in working with companies that, who, you know, companies who call me and say, we have a negative culture, can you help us? Uh, all of this webinar sort of comes from you know, those examples of what not to do. Um, you know, the, these are things that they have in common where their core values and their, uh, their core, they're not using their core values as core competencies, for example. Okay, so what you would do then is take your core competencies, you, you turn your core values into core competencies, and then you put your core competencies in your performance evaluation forms. Um, and now you're measuring people on those performance, uh, or on those competencies. Um, you also have to use your core values daily. So core values, again, a lot of organizations uh, create core values and then they don't do anything with them. So let's talk through some of the ways that you can use your core values. One is to include behavior-based interview questions around your core values uh, so that you can ensure anybody new coming in meets your core values. You can find books that are related to your core values and have everybody read them. You know, you can buy books on Amazon for $3 these days. Um, find, so for example, if one of your core values is resilience, then find a book about resilience and have everyone read it. You can challenge employees to self-identify how they can better align their own work and their core values. You can challenge managers to work with their teams to audit their practices and ensure alignment with core values. So you can essentially say, hey managers, meet with your teams, talk about core values, and make sure that you're all in line with the core values. Uh, or you could ask each department to choose a core value and create a little training around it. This is one of my favorites. It's good, good uh, team building, ha have a little fun with it. You know, the trainings aren't going to be the greatest trainings in the world, but they're, they'll be fun and a chance to bring people together. Now, as I mentioned, Mentioned, we have a list of 30 ways to bring your core values to life. If you stay on to the end of the webinar, I will send that list to you. And this quote, I think, is a nice way to sum it up. 
never compromise your values. Uh, don't, don't just create core values for your organization and then do nothing with them. You, you have to use them. They're a huge part of culture. Okay, so let's move on and talk lastly about onboarding. So um, this is another fail that I see with organizations where they train new hires, but they don't onboard them. So training is like orientation. You know, orientation means you orient or orientate people to your organization. You give them a tour, you show them where the bathroom is, you introduce them around to managers, that's all orientation. Onboarding is a much more complicated process. Onboarding is about giving clarity to people around their job, around their role, and where they fit in the organization. Onboarding is about helping them build confidence, helping them experience self-efficacy. The sooner they experience that, the better, the more productive they'll be. Um, they need to feel comfortable and confident in their own skin. Onboarding is about connection. You need people to feel connected to their peers, their job tasks, and the organization's vision, mission, and core values. And then culture. Onboarding is about bringing people into the culture. So one way to think about this is what if you flew to Japan or some other company, country where you didn't speak the language, you didn't know anything about that country, would it be easier for you if somebody met you at the airport and took you around? that would be like onboarding versus uh, you having your book to find out where the bathroom is and how to ask uh, for simple things. You know, you want the, the organization to sort of be this metaphorical person that's waiting at the airport for you to show you around. That's what new hires need. So one big mistake I see with organizations is on, in onboarding is they don't do either of these two things. They don't involve everybody in the onboarding process and they don't celebrate the new hire. So often when a new hire comes on, it's like, oh my gosh, now I gotta take time out of my day to uh, you know, train this person, I don't have time, and everybody's sort of nervous about it, and it feels like this person's a little bit of a burden. You gotta remove that feeling and instead celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. Uh, one of my favorite examples is a, a startup tech company that has a throne in their cafeteria and when a new hire starts, they set that new hire in that throne and they throw a party in their honor. So this person gets to be king for a couple hours or queen for a couple of hours while they have a party in this person's honor. And actually the entire organization does a little choreographed dance for the person sitting in the chair. Um, that is celebration. That person's never leaving. Their you know, turnover, I'm sure, is very low at that organization. So that's a great example of celebration. And again, you have to involve everyone. So it should not just be up to HR and the person's manager to onboard. Everybody has to be involved in onboarding. So let me give you some fun ideas for onboarding. Uh, one is to ask the new hires team to create a survival basket of goodies. So what I mean by that is uh, maybe they get a $5 gift card for the restaurant down the street that everybody always eats at and maybe a bar of chocolate and maybe uh, some headphones, uh, you know, getting everybody to sort of contribute one item to the goodie basket uh, is a great way to involve the person's whole team. Another fun example that I love is to record a video of the new hires team. So just pull out your phone, ask the new hires team to just kind of say, hey, we can't wait to see you, and then put it on YouTube and send it out. Uh, and, you know, it's just a great way to welcome this new person in. Take new hires around the pop property to see the layout, and then a fun way to make sure they took it all in is to put them on a scavenger hunt the next day to make sure they know. So you could maybe hide things around the work site or have them interact with certain people to obtain some certain item, just a fun, fun way. Uh, another idea is a new hire bingo card <laughs> with information about employees, and then the new hire gives them something to talk about so they can kind of say, hey, on the bingo card, it says, uh, I have to find somebody who uh, has been skydiving before. Do you know who that person is? And then they can, it gives them a conversation starter. Uh, another important task is to make sure that you make the company history interesting. So in order for people to feel connected to your workplace and feel engaged to the work that they're doing, they do need to understand the history of the organization. So that's gonna be uh, important. So a lot of times organizations just kind of give a paragraph in the corporate policy handbook, um, but make it interesting. Share, share the real story about how the company came to be and why it came to be. 
and then again have a party. Now we have a long list, a 14 page list that we give clients who we're working with on their onboarding programs. And if you can, you can kind of see on the slide, we assign things to HR, we assign things to the new hires manager, and we assign things to the team members. So the team members really understand that they are a big part of the onboarding process and they're held accountable. Um, so this is something that, that we give out, um, that, and I'll tell you how to get a hold of that at the end of the, the course here, at the end of the webinar. Lastly, you just wanna make sure you're measuring satisfaction with onboarding. So measure onboarding uh, satisfaction from the employee, and you know, just give them a few questions to fill out. Don't forget to measure satisfaction from the managers. So managers who are responsible for onboarding, you need them to find it satisfaction satisfactory you need them to feel good about the onboarding process so don't forget to ask them how they feel about onboarding one other uh, form that we use and I'll tell you how to get a hold of this in a minute here um, is for you know to kind of keep track of how the new employee is doing uh, and this would be a form that the manager can fill out and then you can fill in the job tasks uh, and then the manager can kind of say at 30 days they're proficient, at 60 days they are, 90 days they are, um, keeping track of the core values and then also keeping track of their social integration to make sure that they are feeling, you know, the manager can sort of observe whether or not this person is fitting in and this is a way to sort of quantify uh, how this person is doing and fitting in. So why did you show up today? Well, maybe you showed up because you want to make your work environment better because you know it's the right thing to do. Maybe you showed up because you're sick and tired of dealing with all the workplace drama. Maybe you showed up because deep down you know that you can make the lives of your workforce better and that you're excited about creating an organization where people thrive, love what they do, and respect each other. Or maybe you want to elevate your HR skills. And you might be feeling like you're here. Culture change is a huge, long, complicated process. And you might feel like you're sort of on this desolate road and you've got a long way to go. And maybe you'd prefer to be here, you know, a lot farther down the road at a beach motel uh, with a great view and uh, on a much better drive. And you have two ways, two options for getting down the road of culture change. You can go as a tortoise or you can go as a hare. So I have a gift for you to help you get down that road more of a, like a hare than a tortoise. So I wanted to introduce you to the Culture Makeover Masterclass. This is an online course that we put together. The Workplace Culture Makeover Masterclass is absolutely the most cost-effective and easiest way to make culture change. Now, when I say you know, easy, I recognize culture change in and of itself is easy and I'm not gonna pretend that it is. Culture change is a process. But when I say cost effective and easy, what I'm saying is that I've broken the process of culture change up for you into bite-sized steps so that you can make culture change without an expensive consultant and you can make change without really getting lost in the, in the weeds. So I'm literally through the online course gonna take you through a step-by-step -step process for culture change. You get an eight module online learning program with 35 videos, 36 handouts and counting. I'm sure we'll be adding to it along the way. And I'm also gonna give you slides, a workbook and a facilitator's guide so that you can deliver the very same training that I give my clients when I work with clients on culture change. So if you hired me to come and do that training myself, at a minimum, you'd be looking at five or seven grand to have me come and do the training and I'm giving it to you so that you can deliver it yourself. So here's what's covered in the course. Uh, real quickly, you'll get, I know there's a lot on there, but essentially the course takes you through how to conduct your own survey, how to interpret the survey results and put it together, how to create an action committee so that you have a team of eight people from your workforce that helps you uh, make the culture change and ultimately how to create a strategic plan with that committee. In module five, I'll talk with you more about using your vision and your, co your core values. I'll talk with you about using your performance management system for change. And I'll talk with you about interviewing and onboarding. Now, I know I skipped module seven there because module seven is where the training is. So again, you'll get the slides, the workbook, and the facilitator's guide so that you can deliver a company-wide training program on 
you know, building a positive civil work environment to your, you know, this is for your entire organization. You also get a second training program that's specifically for managers, and it's essentially around helping managers understand how to create a positive work environment inside their own teams. And again, you get the slides, the attendee workbook, and a facilitator's guide. By the time you're done with, with the eight modules, you will have created and distributed a survey to your organization. You'll have created an action committee to help you make change. You'll have implemented and executed a strategic plan for culture change. You'll have trained your workforce. You'll have updated your performance management system, and you'll have updated your recruiting, interviewing, and onboarding processes. So it's online. You can do this at your own pace, and if you take action, these are all of the things you'll have done by the time the eight modules are over. So I'm going to be selling the course for $16.97, but it's not available until November 10. November 10 is our launch date. So I'm offering a pre-order price to you all. You guys are on my e-newsletter list, so I wanted to offer it up to you before I launched it at this bigger price. So it's a price of $14.97 for you. If you buy the course before November 10, I will also give you a pre-order bonus. You'll get another training program. So it's actually a third training program that's for leaders and managers. So you'll have the, the one that's for your company. You'll have the one that's for your managers that's inside the course but I'm gonna give you this bonus training that's also for managers, and it's ultimately around how to go from being a manager to being a leader. So it's around influence and buy-in. Uh, leaders have, I'm sorry, managers have to be well-versed in how to lead a team through culture change, and that's what this training is all about. So this is a total value of quite a lot of money. So by the time you're done, if you were to, to purchase this at $14.97 before November 10, you'll have the full eight-module culture makeover online course. That course includes two training programs. Again, if I were to do that training myself, it would cost you five to seven grand minimum. Uh, I'm putting the materials themselves at $1,500 each. Plus, you'll get the pre-sale bonus training that's an additional $1,500. So you're getting a whole lot for just $14.97. So if you're interested, there's a whole bunch more information there at civilitypartners.com slash makeover. The other thing I wanted to point out is that if you do the work and you're not satisfied, I will give you a refund. So I believe so strongly in these eight modules that uh, if, if you do everything you're supposed to do in those modules and you're still not finding culture change, I will give you a refund. So again, go to civilitypartners.com slash makeover. It's $14.97 until November 10. After November 10, it go, the price goes up and you do not get that bonus training. So here's what's gonna happen next. You're gonna go to civilitypartners.com slash makeover. You'll find my sort of sales page there. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll find where you just click that enroll today. You'll make one payment of $14.97. You'll fill in your credit card information. And from there, you'll get a, a receipt email from us you'll be redirected to our thank you page. And then on November 10 is when you will get the login information. So again, the course isn't launching until November 10. This is my, my uh, way of saying thanks for being on my e-newsletter list by, by giving it to you at a lower price until November 10. Um, and then once November 10 hits, you'll get your login information and you'll have access to all of the uh, modules. So just remember that nothing I've shared today with you is theory. All of these steps works that I offered. I know that because I use them with my own clients. Uh, everything I talked about today is supported by my own experiences working with clients and the experience of others in the field of culture change. I didn't make all this stuff up. Um, so here is, again, where you get the information, civilitypartners.com slash makeover. It's $14.97 until November 10. There's my email address if you have any other questions and want to get a hold of me. Um, so with that, we've got two minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Let me see here. Who's on board? Maybe I'll start with that by asking you a question. Who's on board? Who is going to civilitypartners.com makeover right now? All right. So someone says, I love the fun ideas. Can you share those with us? So I'm assuming you're talking about those onboarding ideas. Kelly, those onboarding ideas, that onboarding checklist is all inside the eight modules. 
Um, I will show you the 30 ways to bring your core values to life, though. Do you provide guidance through the program or is it independent? So the, the program is online. It's meant for you to take in your, on your own time, um, but we, do, we will be having a LinkedIn uh, group so that you can get a hold of me there if you want to ask questions in the LinkedIn group. And of course, I'm never going to leave you hanging. If you ever had questions or were in a tough spot as you went through it, you would always be free to email. We can set up a call. And uh, I absolutely, you know, would never leave you hanging. So don't feel like, you know, once you buy it, you'll never hear from me again. All right, I've got someone who says, with approval from the CEO, I'm purchasing. I've got someone who says, I'm excited to move forward, heading to the website now. Uh, let's see, I've got, uh, is it on demand as well? Uh, Elizabeth, I don't understand your question. Will it be on demand? The, the, once you purchase the, the modules, you have access to the modules from now until forever. So you can listen to, to the modules whenever you want. Um, and, and take action whenever you want. Um, in terms of the webinar, the webinar will be available, the recording will be available for about a week and then we'll take it down if you wanted to re-listen. Uh, let's see, I've got someone who says, uh, I'm coaching an HR manager on onboarding, so I'll recommend this course. Well, thank you very much, I appreciate that. Let's see what else I've got. I'm in, I've got I'm in, I've got, uh, my little question boxes. I ah, I, with all the questions, the <laughs> thing keeps going. <laughs> can a person see them at any time? Uh, yes, you can see the modules at any time. You're free to watch them whenever, whenever you want. All right, any other last questions before we log off? All right, well, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope that I gave you some good tips. I hope you can feel my passion for positive work environments. I see a lot of uh, bad things happening, and uh, I, this is my attempt at helping resolve some of those bad things. So hopefully uh, you were able to take in some, some good ideas, and thank you again.